I have a couple of announcements to make. One is your exams are all graded and they've been sent for scanning. Um, the average is about 64, so great job. That's a lot better than last time. So I think uh, you've been working really hard and, and I'm happy that, that everybody's learning material. Um, other announcements. Next week is the last week of the quarter. That means um, it's the last PCHEM seminar that you can go to for extra credit. So if you want to do it, that's the last chance. And again, those are due a week after the seminar. So that'll be the last one. Um, people have been asking me about the final. It is definitely cumulative. Everything is going to be on it. It's two hours. So it'll be long. Um, does anybody have any more questions about stuff like that? Logistics, the final? Yes? Will the final be about the same difficulty of the exams? Yeah, the final will be pretty comparable to things you've seen before. I don't think there, there will be any surprises. Obviously, it'll be longer because there's more time and it, and, and it has to cover everything. But otherwise, I, I think it'll be pretty comparable. Yes? How many cheat sheets? One. Same as, uh, as before. Yes? Uh, will it be equally distributed between uh, everything you learned, or is it going to be heavy on the stuff we're about to learn? It's going to be pretty equally distributed among everything that we've seen this quarter. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Um, so PCHEM is really hard. and. Uh, it takes some time to understand some of the concepts, and not everybody gets it right away. I didn't hear that. Um, but so what really matters, to me at least, is what you know at the end. And so if you did really well on the final, and you have happened to stink it up on one of the previous uh, exams, then that will be taken into account. So that is why the final is completely cumulative. There's sort of uh, equal amounts of everything we've learned. And uh, you know, if there's a, there's a distribution of what's, what's worth how much, and that's the default situation. But if there's a situation where you know, somebody did really, really poorly on one of the previous exams and much better on the final, then that will be taken into account. This, um, you know, I, I pretty much always do this in PCHEM. Um, it usually affects a small but non-zero number of people's grades. So, you know, most, mostly it, it's not, uh, it doesn't make such a big difference, but sometimes it does. So if you had a problem with one of the previous midterms, I really encourage you to make sure that you understand what you did wrong and be able to, uh, to do better on the final. All right, any more questions? OK, let's uh, start talking about StatMEC. All right, so in a way, this is a, a really big departure from the things that we've been doing. So, so far in, in, in this quarter of PCHEM, we've talked about some aspects of molecular symmetry and how this relates to spectroscopy and how, how spectroscopy works in all its different forms and how we can use that to get structures of molecules. And the whole emphasis so far has really been on individual molecules and how we can determine their properties. Of course, we're talking about bulk techniques. Usually when we do spectroscopy, we're not looking at a single molecule. We have a whole ensemble of them. But we're ignoring that fact. We're, and we're fundamentally concerned about properties of one molecule, whether it's geometry or electronic structure or vibrations and rotations, things like that. And now with StatMEC, we're going to make the transition to talking more about ensembles of molecules and properties that have to do with what happens when you get a whole group of molecules together. StatMEC is a really important sort of bridging topic because this is what makes the connection between all of these individual level properties of molecules, the microscopic picture that we've been learning about, and the macroscopic properties that you know from thermal. 
So this is, uh, you know, hopefully a topic that, that helps to make some connections between how do we know this stuff on the, on the microscopic level and how can we use it to tell us something about the bulk properties of, you know, things that, that we get from thermodynamics. Okay, so let's start with relating it back to a topic that we've been talking about recently, which is NMR. So in our whole discussion of NMR, I have mentioned many times that the population difference is really small. When you put your sample in a magnetic field, that breaks the degeneracy of the spin states and it induces a population difference between spins that are aligned with the magnetic field versus against the magnetic field. And I keep saying that this population difference is really small and that's why we need a big magnet if we want to see a stronger signal. Let's look at what else that depends on and see if we can quantify what that energy difference is. So, so far we just know that it's not very big. So here's an expression for the actual energy difference. So the big ends here are numbers of molecules. So this is the ratio number of spins in the state beta over the number of spins in the state alpha. And it has a pretty simple functional form. So we have this exponential. It depends on h nu sub i. That's its resonant frequency. So that's the Larmor frequency of our nucleus. And then in the denominator, there's Boltzmann's constant and the temperature. And so that's it. This, this really simple expression tells us about how it would be more quantitatively, what's the population difference between the spins. And the extra alpha spins are the ones that make up this magnetization vector that's pointing along Z that we've been talking about manipulating in terms of NMR. And so this is why we say that in a normal equilibrium population of spin states, most of our spins aren't giving us anything. We don't have very much of an excess of alpha over beta. Now we can quantify that, and that also gives us maybe another parameter that we can change in order to uh, increase the, the sensitivity. So we know that this depends on the energy difference, which of course depends on the Larmor frequency, and there's a dependence on the magnetic field in there, so we can increase the magnetic field. We could also lower the temperature. Of course, the problem with doing that in a practical sense is that to really change the Boltzmann populations in an NMR sample, we have to make it really, really cold. We have to get down to, you know, millikelvin to really make a, a very big difference in the, the populations. So it's typically not, to, not the most practical thing to do, at least in chemistry experiments. One thing I just want to mention as, as a little aside is, um, so people who have done NMR in the context of organic chemistry, have you heard of a, of a cryoprobe for enhancing sensitivity? So that's a, that's a cool NMR instrument that people want to have. And a lot of times people who are using NMR as a technique see this and they say, okay, we have a cryoprobe for enhancing sensitivity, and they think that what that's doing is cooling down your sample and changing the Boltzmann the, the, uh, the Boltzmann factor. It's not. What that's actually doing, your sample is still at room temperature. The electronics of the probe are cold. And so that's just reducing thermal noise in the electronics. So that's how a cryoprobe works. It has nothing to do with this at all. It's just increasing the sensitivity of the instrument by reducing thermal noise from random motions of electrons in the, the electronics themselves. Okay, not so important to StatMech, but I just wanted to mention it because it's, uh, it's something that comes up. Okay, so here's an expression for our magnetization vector in terms of the Boltzmann constant with all of these factors in there. So we have N, which is the number of spins. Of course, that's going to be important. If you want a larger signal, you can put in a, a bigger sample or a more concentrated sample. We have this factor of gamma squared H bar squared I times I plus one. I is uh, the quantum number of the nucleus. 
And then again, we have this Boltzmann constant and the temperature in the denominator. So this is kind of our, our first view of an example of what do these population differences look like. And I'm going to sort of go back and forth between talking about fundamentals of you know, probability distributions and things like that, and also showing examples of kinds of things that we've seen before, and then we'll tie the two together at the end. Okay, so here's what we're really talking about with StatMech. And let's, let's make an analogy to our previous discussions last quarter and this quarter of single molecules. So if we're talking about single molecules on the microscopic level, the thing that tells us everything we need to know about that is a wave function. So as we've seen, there are all different kinds of wave functions. I mean, so you first learned about them, you know, way back in general chemistry in the context of electronic structure. But, you know, we've learned that there are all kinds of vibrational wave functions. There are NMR wave functions, some of which don't even necessarily look like a function in a traditional sense so much. But this is the thing that describes what the properties of the molecule look like. And in quantum mechanics and spectroscopy, that's the quantity that tells us uh, everything we need to know about the system. In statistical mechanics, the thing that we're interested in is called the partition function. And the partition function applies to an, a, macrosoc a macroscopic ensemble of molecules. And it tells us about how the energy is distributed among different degrees of freedom in the whole system. But you can't have a partition function for one molecule. It's something that's, that is an ensemble property. However, it is tied into what the individual molecules are doing via probability concepts. Okay, so the partition function is going, to t is going to be what tells us the thermodynamic information about an ensemble of molecules in terms of what's going on with the individual molecules. So let's look at what we mean when we talk about an ensemble. So the ensemble is a system of n molecules, where n is going to be really large in typical samples that we're going to look at. And it has some total energy, which we can call E. And you know, again, as you've seen in uh, general chemistry, and thermo, just uh, out of curiosity, how many people have taken thermo, either in physics or engineering? Okay, quite a few. But everybody's seen the basics in general chemistry. You remember the kinetic molecular theory of gases and you know, how this relates to the ideal gas law. We know that if we have an ensemble of molecules, even though they're all identical, they don't all have identical kinetic energies or velocities or anything like that at particular points in time. There's always a distribution. And so all kinds of these thermodynamic properties that we're interested in, like enthalpy and the temperature and things like that, are all dependent on the distribution of energies. And our distribution doesn't look like a delta function. It has some kind of uh, spread out shape. And you know, again, from the looking at the uh, kinetic molecular theory of gases, we remember that if we reduce the temperature of our sample, we get a sharper peak. So we have, um, you know, more of the the molecules in the the uh, the minimum energy or the the uh, maximum energy state, and we have more of the molecules in the maximum likelihood state. I should be uh, be careful there. And also, we have fewer that have higher energy. Whereas, if we make more energy available to the system, the distribution not only shifts to higher energy, it gets more spread out. We have more diversity of, of states going on. We're going to look at that in more detail later. Another piece of information that is important to all of this is that collisions are important to redistribution of energy. So that's how molecules change their state. They run into each other, they run into the walls of the container, 
and uh, that's how energy gets re redistributed. That's important because one of the things that we're going to look at is um, a lot of times in StatMech, we, we make the assumption that if we take a snapshot of a whole huge ensemble and look at the states of all the molecules and the distribution of that, that that's equivalent to watching a single molecule over a really long time occupying all these different states. And so you do need collisions to be able to uh, redistribute energy. OK, so let's talk about our ensemble in a little bit more formal terms. So we have our system of n molecules, and the whole thing has energy E. But what are the individual molecules doing? So stuff is going to move around. It's going to change with time. But on average, there are n sub i molecules in some state epsilon sub i. How many states are there total? That depends on the specifics of the system. We're going to see some more specifics later on. But however many of them there are, the total energy, E, is just going to be the sum of the individual energies, of course, weighted by how many molecules are in each state. And the total energy that we have can be partitioned among the various states. And that's why this thing is called the partition function. And for any particular system, the lowest energy state is epsilon naught. And we generally define that to be 0 and measure the other states relative to it, because that makes stuff easier to deal with. Is it really 0? No, it's the 0 point energy of the system. But we look at uh, the energy of other states relative to it. OK, so what does this look like for some realistic systems? <clears throat> so here are some, uh, some proteins that have some different conformational states. And if you look at these little free energy diagrams associated with them, there are different conformational states that the proteins can occupy. There are little local minima, and there are barriers between them. These are some. This is, this is just some examples of different states that have different energies that molecules can occupy. And as you can imagine, for something like a protein, that's going to have serious consequences for the function of the molecule. Some of these conformational states are going to be more active than others. And if you have everything frozen into a low energy state that is not uh, active, then the molecule isn't going to be as active as if you have more energy available to, to mix among these states. Here's, uh, here's another picture of that showing for some of these particular minima in conformational states, which of these conformations are active, inactive, or partially active. So this is a good reason why we might want to know something about the distribution of, of energy that's available to the system. and how the molecules are partitioned among the different states. It's uh, a lot more general than this. We can do a lot of things with, uh, with statistical mechanics. That's just one practical example. OK, so if we have our ensemble of molecules, the lowest energy state is the zero point energy, which we're going to define as zero. And then the set of populations in each of these states is the number n for each of the states summed over all of the possible states. And of course, the number of molecules in all the states, when we add them all up, has to equal the total number of molecules in the system. So if we take our system of a bunch of molecules and take a snapshot so we get an instantaneous picture of what's going on, then there are n sub 0 molecules in the lowest energy state. There are n sub 1 in E sub 1, et cetera. Again, what, uh, 
what defines this. It's going to be some sort of Boltzmann distribution based on the relative energies of the states, but we haven't, uh, we haven't quite gotten back to that yet. OK, so we need to write down our instantaneous configuration. And here, this is just notation. So this is how we write down you know, how many molecules are in each of the states. And this is an important thing to be able to do because the probabilities of the states are going to be t are going to come into account here. So a typical case is that a lot of the, a lot of times the lowest energy state is not necessarily the most populated because the degeneracy of it is low. So there, in many cases, it's non-degenerate. So there's only one way to occupy the lowest energy states, whereas Higher energy states are going to have a lot more degeneracy. OK, so some configurations are a lot more probable than others. So as I was just saying, if we have all of the molecules in the ground state, so we make our sample really, really, really cold, and we try to put all of the molecules in the ground state, that means that our total number of molecules n are all in that state, and all of our other states have zero occupancy. So there's only one way to do that. Now let's say that we have two molecules in the first excited state and the rest in the ground state. So now we have n minus 2 molecules in the ground state and then we have two in the next excited state, and then zero for everything else. Let's look at how to write down the number of ways to achieve this configuration. So you can intuitively see where this is going, right? So there's only one way to put everything in the ground state. It's like you have a whole bunch of pennies in a bunch of boxes you could put them in. And if you have all the pennies in one box, there's only one way to do that. But now if you are going to promote two of them to the first excited state, then you know, you're taking two pennies out of the, the first box and putting them in the second one. You can pick any of the, the pennies you want. So there are more ways to do that. And so the general expression for this uh, relates to how many choices you have. So when you pick the first one out, so you take your, your first penny out of the box, you have n choices because you could pick absolutely any one of them. But then when you go to take the second one, you only have n minus 1 choices left because you already took one out. So this is how we, uh, we go to write these down. So there are n sub 0 factorial ways to select that uh, bin. And so in general, here's a, an expression for the number of distinguishable configurations that we can make with some set of objects that can be put in different bins. And again, this is completely general for probability of sorting anything in any kind of way. You know, here we're talking about the specifics of putting molecules in different excited states, but it's completely general. OK, so another thing to remember with these systems of large molecules is that they're really, really large. We have you know, Avogadro's number or you know, even more molecules moving around. The system is fluctuating randomly all the time. And it's almost always going to be found in the more likely configurations. And so that's why sticking everything all in the ground state is really, really unlikely. So when n is large, stuff is almost always going to be found in the, uh, the more probable configurations. All right, so we can, we can look at the weight of a configuration, or how likely it, it is to, to happen, by defining the weight. So we already talked about this on the previous slide. Now we're just giving it a name. So this is the, 
the number of ways that you can achieve a particular configuration, and of course, that's related to how likely it is. And so we can, uh, we can make some approximations. So we know that, uh, Yeah, we'll get into the approximations in a minute. OK, so just a quick sort of practice exercise. If we look at 20 identical objects with six different uh, states they can be in, and they have the following configurations, If you have a calculator, work this out and see, uh, see what you get. What you will learn is that the number is surprisingly large. So even for, you know, we only have 20 things, which you could imagine a, you know, a cluster of 20 molecules is really unrealistically small. You know, again, in the case of molecules, we're talking about uh, Avogadro's number or even more things going on. But here we only have 20 molecules, and we have six, let's call them vibrational states. So we have stuff in the ground state and maybe five excited states. So you know, a very small system in the chemical sense. And we get something like, 9.3 times 10 to the 8 configurations for this really unrealistically tiny system. So this is something to remember when we're talking about uh, partition functions and as you're developing an intuitive sense for which states are going to be more populated than others. At first, you know, when we look at the intensities of spectra, like when we talked about rotational spectra and why the intensities of the peaks look the way they do, you know, at first it's kind of surprising that the ground state isn't the most populated. But when we start to think about numbers like these and realize that there's only one way to get the ground state, whereas the higher energy states have a lot more degeneracy, then we start to see why the lowest energy states are not the most populated. OK, so now we can. Uh, we can start to think about using some approximations. So we have this expression for W. It turns out taking the natural log of it is useful because we can rearrange some stuff just using the properties of, uh, of natural logs. And we can write this thing in a little bit different form that enables us to use Sterling's approximation. And this is a really nice thing to be able to do, because taking factorials of huge numbers is uh, difficult. Um, it's computationally intensive when we start to talk about realistic systems. And it provides lots of opportunities for, uh, for making mistakes. So it's useful to be able to use these approximations. So Sterling's approximation is just natural log of x factorial is approximately equal to x ln x minus x. And so we can use that to get an approximate expression for the weight of our configuration. So again, this just simplifies things and makes our lives easier. And in, in the actual systems that we're generally talking about, there are so many different confirmations and ways to achieve them that this is a fine enough approximation. OK, so now the next thing that we want to do is try to find what's the dominant configuration. So we said that 
the ground state is not the most populated because although it has the lowest energy, it's unlikely because there's only one way to get it. So how do we find the, uh, the dominant configuration? So to do that, we're going to want to maximize the weight. So we want the maximum likelihood of being in a particular conformation. And so we're going to do that by varying n sub i, the number of molecules in that, in that state i. And we're going to look for the first derivative of w to be 0. And so we can write down some expressions like this. So for example, we know that uh, if we add up all the, the total numbers of molecules, we have to get capital N, which is the, the total number that we started with. And if we add up the numbers of molecules in each state times the energy of that state, then we better get the total energy. And then we would like to be able to maximize our configuration. So unfortunately, we can't just set that equal to 0 and solve for it. That would be nice and convenient. But it doesn't work that way because the populations aren't independent. So if we take, you know, if, if we take a, a molecule from one state, that means we have to put it into another state to do that. They all have to go somewhere. We have a limited number of states for molecules to be in. So the NIs are not independent, and uh, we have to worry about that. So you know, instead, we just, we're just going to uh, you know, use a, variable, a variational method to, uh, to maximize this. OK, so what we end up with is um, the solution where we have uh, ni over n is going to have these uh, exponential weights. And this constant beta determines the most probable populations. And beta equals 1 over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. And I know I need to give you um, some practice problems for this material, but exploring the, these kind of uh, things is something that you're going to need to do in the homework so you can see how it works. But so what it comes down to is pretty simple and beautiful. So we have this, this parameter Boltzmann's constant that comes out of, of looking at these kinds of probabilities. And it also gives us another way to understand what the temperature means. So one thing that, that comes up you know, when people take thermo for the first time is you know, people say, oh, entropy is really confusing. And you know, this is something that, that uh, you know, ends up sounding really mysterious when you take thermo. I don't think so. I think uh, entropy is actually pretty intuitive. You know, that's just talking about the numbers of ways to get different confirmations. The thing that's confusing is temperature. You know, how does this, uh, you know, what, what does it actually mean? And what does it look like on the microscopic level compared to our sort of everyday understanding of temperature? So it does fall out of this uh, discussion of what's the, uh, the dominant configuration of uh, our states. OK, so the only confirmations that are allowed are ones that are consistent with having constant total energy. So you can't have uh, you know, configurations that don't, uh, yeah, you can't have configurations that don't conserve energy in the same system. So that's another way of saying that if you add up the, the uh, number of molecules in each state times the energy of that state, you have to get the total energy out of that. And the populations are not independent. And these are our constraints on the system. <clears throat> 
And so again, when we go to minimize our we're going to uh, maximize our weight and get the dominant configuration. We can't just set that to zero because you know, we said they're not independent. And so we need to use variational methods like, uh, for example, you can use Lagrange multipliers, which uh, means you want to multiply your constra each constraint by a constant and add it to the whole thing and then treat your variables as independent. OK, so who has seen Lagrange, multi Lagrange multipliers and this kind of methodology before? OK, quite a few, but not everybody. All right, I will definitely uh, come up with some practice problems for this. All right, so this is. Um, so what I've, what I've done here is I'm just putting in, I'm, I'm just multiplying a constant times each of these constraints, that being, you know, having to add up the total number of, the, add up the number of molecules in each state and get the total number and add up the energy of the molecules in all the states and get the total energy. And I'm putting in these constants, alpha and beta, related to those and then just putting that into my um, original equation that I'm trying to maximize and then I can treat these things as independent since my constraints are in here. And so now, given these constraints, alpha and beta, that came from the limitations on our system that we know from just physical common sense, now that these constraints are in here, now my populations are all independent and I can do this. I can set DLNW equal to zero And so this expression is going to be equal to zero when Ni has its most probable values. And so I get this expression for LNW. And notice I changed the uh, index on the sum before differentiating LNW just uh, to avoid confusion. And so then if we do that, if we differentiate it, here's what we get. And so we can take the derivative of the first term And here's what we end up with so far. And let me get to uh, the derivative of the second term. I know I'm going through this quickly. Basically, at this point, I just want to get to the result. And you can see essentially how we get there. And then you're going to do a little bit of practice with this in the homework problems. And we can go back and talk about it if people are confused. OK. so. So I changed the index on the summation so as to not get the differentiation variable ni confused with, the, uh, with what we're summing over. And so if, if uh, we get this situation where if i does not equal j, uh, dn, j, dn, i equals 0. And if it does, it equals 1. And so we get this expression in terms of a direct delta function. And what falls out of the whole thing is this. So we had to take the derivative of the first term and the second term separately. And so we get uh, minus ln n sub i plus 1 plus ln n plus 1. And so that just gives us minus the natural log of n sub i over n, which comes back to these things that we've been looking at that uh, we get as a Boltzmann distribution. OK, so now let's put this back in in terms of our constraints. 
So we've got this thing that came out as ln n sub i over n. And then remember, we had to add in our constraints. So there are constants associated with you know, having to add up the total number of molecules to big N and having to add up all the energies to the total energy. And so that's where we get uh, these parameters if we look at, uh, at what alpha and beta mean. Then we see that, uh, that beta determines the most probable populations, and this comes out in terms of temperature. So again, that was fast. Um, you know, if you've seen sort of Lagrange multipliers before, or if you haven't, hopefully at least you get an idea of where it comes from. I don't expect everybody to get all the details right away. I just kind of wanted to go through it once and introduce it. You will have some practice on this for the homework. The really important thing to take away from it right now is the result, and that this is where the Boltzmann distribution comes from. Okay, so here are our relative populations. If you have, if you want to know how much of the, the molecules present are in state I versus state J, we take the uh, ratio of the, these Boltzmann factors. And so what we can see right away, and the, the take home message is that the relative populations of two states falls off exponentially with their energy difference. And so for example, we can go back to looking at rotational states, you know, as we talked about in uh, the early part of the quarter with rotational spectroscopy, and actually come up with a, a quantitative uh, expression for the relative populations of the J equals one and J equals zero rotational states of, AC, of HCL at 25 degrees. And so this is gonna be based on, you know, we said it falls off exponentially with their energy difference, but it's also gonna be based on their degeneracy. So for the, the, uh, the ground state, there's no degeneracy, right? That's, uh, there's only one way to do that. For J equals one, we have three different values of M sub J. We have minus one, zero, and plus one. And so its degeneracy is three. So <clears throat> there are three times as many ways to get that first excited state as uh, the ground state, even though it costs more energy to get there. And so again, here's what the, uh, the spectrum looks like. <clears throat> so we already know that the ground state isn't the most populated. The energy of a level with quantum number J is HC times the rotational constant times um, J times J plus one. So the difference between these two states is gonna be two HC B, and we can look up the value of the rotational constant for HCL. And so at 298 Kelvin, we have to make sure to put these things in Kelvin so that our units work out. We get about 207 wave numbers for this factor KT over HC. And so then to get our relative populations, we have to stick this factor of the degeneracy in front of it. So we have three over one for the difference in degeneracy. And then it falls off exponentially as the energy difference with, between the two states. And so the relative populations here are described by this quantity. And we get the uh, factor that we have about 2.7 times more intensity in this first excited state than the ground state, which you know, it's not exact, but it tracks pretty reasonably with the degeneracy. So we see that we have two factors here when determining the relative populations of states. One is their energy difference, and that's important, but the degeneracy, in a way, is, is even more important because we have a lot of, uh, of molecules 
and the probable confirmations are much more likely to be occupied. OK, so again, you know, we're just starting to get into this stuff. We're going to talk about it more. We're going to have some practice problems. The take home message so far is you should be able to look at differences in states. You should know how the relative populations depend on the degeneracy and also the energy difference between them. If you can't reproduce these derivations right now, that's all right. We're going to have some more opportunities to practice. Um, the main thing is just knowing the result. Um, we're going to quit there for today, and I will see you next time.